Hello, welcome back to Changing the Game. I'm excited for this episode with a two-time Olympian in track and field representing Puerto Rico. Eric Alejandro has competed uh, at an elite level, the most elite level in the 400 meter hurdles and is excited to share the STEM behind his experiences as a track and field athlete, as an Olympian. And let's get him on. I had some technical difficulties earlier, but um, I'm excited to have him on now. Hopping in on the live. Uh, looks like he's connecting right now. So, what's up? Oh. How are you doing? Finally, I'm sorry about that, guys. There's no some technical issues on my part. So, yeah, maybe I should have got a little, <laughs> a little better. We're but here. I'm good. I'm good, Jay. It's nice to see you, man. Yeah, same. Glad you could join us. I was just telling them a little bit about your background, that we're excited to have you as a multi-time uh, Olympian that's excited to share some of the STEM uh, behind your experiences as both an athlete and as an Olympian. Um, and then we're getting in the comments. Um, I was asking teams to share where they're from. We had already seen students from Egypt, from Brazil, from Canada. Um, so <laughs> Egypt, Brazil. I'm excited. I didn't, didn't know how far your reach was, but that's pretty good. I'm yeah, I know Bot Busters is a team from Mexico. For, uh, I, I saw them in Monterrey earlier this year before the okay. kind of COVID hit. Um, so yeah, definitely guys throw in your, your team name or team numbers and where you're from. We've got Argentina, um, a, a wide variety of representation here. Hey, even Puerto Rico, saludos desde Guaynabo. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. You might, you might get a couple of my followers that are going to yeah. start following <laughs> and, and jump in there and ask questions, but, uh, for sure. uh, I'm excited. It's, uh, it's very disappointing what's going on. I was really hoping that you to, this would have been awesome to see in person and to, mm -hmm to have been there um, to talk to everyone and then and, and ex experience what it is the robotics world because it's a completely just how track and field might be to a lot of people the robotics world is to me okay. um, I love what you guys do I love your initiative I love the community the community behind the um, that is first and it's, it's very inspiring to see them wanting to learn so much about my sport because I want to learn about as much as what they do as well and how we can put it together to create something amazing yeah, for sure. So once, you know, once we get back to a more normal with events and stuff, I'll definitely take you to one so you can check it out. When we went in, in Monterrey, there was some of the uh, teammates out there that went and, and checked it out. And, and I don't know if, if you knew, but there's red and blue alliances, just like the show Exatlon. Oh, wow. Um, so for those of you that are tuning in that are Exatlon fans that saw Eric on Exatlon, he was on the red team, I was on the blue team. So uh, when I took... Um, Carla and Moni in, in Monterrey, it was great to see that energy for red and blue. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's all about that community. So whether you're part of the Red Alliance, or Blue Alliance, uh, no matter what country you're from, how long you've been in this or not, it, it's just, it's such a wonderful community. And I'm excited to help them see the STEM that's behind your sport and your world. And, um, you know, they could be the future innovators of of the sport that you're in right they could be the, no, absolutely. The, the shoes of the future the tracks of the future and i am excited to get to get into that but before we do can you just share a little bit about your background growing up what kind of sports you were involved with what you liked what you didn't like kind of how did absolutely. you start your path towards becoming an olympian okay so can you hear me very well is the sound quality good yeah. I, I just put this here but i don't know how good it was but yeah you sound good okay uh wow um i have a very athletic family growing up i have two brothers one older and one younger so we're very competitive we're only three years apart mm -hmm. and so i grew up in a very athletic family my dad was uh athletic as well he was a he was a pro baseball player for the first uh three years of his uh, pro career then he got hurt and joined the military mm -hmm. so i was pretty much raised as a military brat growing up um i had one older brother one younger brother and we grew up very competitive so i tried every sport I tried everything, if my, especially as a, having an older brother, whatever sport he did, I would mm -hmm. love to do as well. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that my dad played baseball, we first played baseball. Um, it was too slow of a sport to me. Um, at that young age, you don't really understand the sport and the, 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 the physicality behind everything you got to, to do to be good in that sport. Mm -hmm. You got to be very patient at that age because everything runs slow. You know, it might take forever for the ball to come to you. It might take forever <laughs> for you to get bad. So you, you kind of lose interest. So. My interest shifted more to a very uh, sport where I can run around a lot and be motive, uh, motivated to want to keep competing, and that was uh, soccer, actually. Okay. Uh, so I played soccer for the most part of my youth until um, about my freshman year of high school. Mm -hmm. 
one thing about me, I was always very fast okay. on my, all my teams. That was always quick, you know, whether it was uh, soccer, whether it was baseball. I was always one of the fastest guys, if not the fastest guy on the team, yeah. which, le which led me to, you know, run track. Uh, so when I got to middle school, I ran a little bit of track, and I was pretty good at it. When I got to my high school years, I decided, let me run. You know, I'm fast. Mm -hmm. I could beat these guys. Um, I found that I'm not the fastest out there. <laughs> there are faster <laughs> There are faster <laughs> people than me. Uh, my dream got shut down real quick because I was I thought I was one of the fast guys, but then you know you realize that you're you're competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, nature wants you to be faster, so I started developing this thing where I wanted to be the fastest on my team, no matter what team I was on. But okay. uh, genetically, I wasn't built the same as like some other athletes who are taller and maybe faster, mm -hmm. or shorter and maybe quicker. So I met this gentleman named Tony Ross, who was Olympic hurdler his dad was a hall of fame olympic coach uh and he's like you know what you have the ability to be a hurdler mm. and it came natural to me jay i just started you know running and jumping hurdles and i was very athletic yeah and uh i just started beating everybody over the hurdles <laughs> i was like okay you can't beat me i can't beat you without the hurdles right come <laughs> yeah, see me come see me over the hurdles and i started beating everybody over the hurdles and it, i was so good that i was ranked in number one in the state my senior year and uh, that took me to college. I ran, I ran uh, at Eastern Michigan University. Actually, I have a nice little poster there. I ran Eastern uh, Michigan yeah. University, 400 hurdles. Uh, and then after I graduated college, there was a void in my life that I wanted to continue. Mm -hmm. So I pretty much quit my job and uh, uh, decided to pursue track and field completely because I, I missed it that much when I graduated college. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to believe that the sport was over for me. It was my passion. It's what I love doing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, to this day, I ran, I qualified for the Olympics, I qualified for Rio, mm -hmm. and uh, I hopefully was getting ready for the Tokyo Olympic Games, but obviously COVID-19 put a hold on a lot of things in everyone's life, so uh, currently, I'll continue to train, I still aspire to get there, but we'll see how it goes, but uh, there's a lot of other little things in between that happen mm -hmm. about my perseverance and, 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 and how I got to get there and how difficult the sport is and all that stuff, maybe we'll get that later down the line, but right now, mm -hmm. just to keep it nice, short, and sweet, not to bore you with my life story, that's, that was the gist of it, yeah. That's great, and I think there's a good lesson in there for the students on the call. Their, their teams are kind of like a track team, because it's all one group going towards a mission, but each person has their different skill sets that, you know, makes you good at, at those items so for example Correct. you know you ended up being a, an elite hurdler but you needed pole vaulters and sprinters and distance Correct. To, to put your whole team together and that's what i feel like for all of you first students on the call is kind of what your team is you've got your mechanical people your electrical people your programmers people that work on the marketing and so just like i i feel like the lesson there is that early on you tried a lot of different things and eventually you ended up finding what your your niche was and i think our students can take that and just you know explore the different areas of robotics the different aspects of the team and then you know find the one that you're most passionate about the one like you said that made you want to quit your job and do nothing but but that you know when, once you find that that sweet spot that area that you're passionate about i think that's probably also what you know really helps drive your your success correct yeah, I agree, hundred fifty percent. I know a lot of different sports that I did. I even played basketball when I was in middle school. I was really good at that. I was a good defender, uh, nice. but nothing like track. It just I had that cardio. I had that, everything just fell into place when I when I started yeah. running track, and it just became part of my life. At that point. Okay, and and you competed in in London as well, correct? I competed in London. Okay, and I also competed in Rio, twenty sixteen. Nice. Uh, yeah, so that was pretty great. London. <laughs> yeah, no this is my room. Happen, right? A little quick of my room. I got the real one over there, and then I have the London right there. I thought I'd give you guys a nice little background. I didn't want to just have a plain old background. I figured that this would be more uh, appropriate <laughs> to what we're talking about. Um, so let's go with that. Like, what, what are some of the key aspects to becoming an elite hurdler, right? I know you had some certain skill sets that you may have gained from other sports, but when it comes to tweaking yourself to be at that level, to be able to go to London, to go to Rio, what are some of those key things that define an elite hurdler versus, you know, the rest of the field? Uh, um, it's, it's very, it's very taxing on the body to be okay. uh, an Olympic hurdler, a 400 meter hurdler, just track and field and anything. I, I think some of the, the most elite sports in the Olympic games would be swimming, wrestling and track and field, because I think they take the most out of you okay. and you don't really see, the benefits till 
you know, you run and you train. Yeah. You know, my race retrospectively is it only it's uh, supposed to last forty nine to fifty seconds. Okay. You know, the, the forty six to fifty seconds now because these guys are running super fast. <laughs> um, it's very very taxing and it takes a lot of perseverance and a lot of sacrifice mm -hmm. because my sport or the four hundred hurdles my individual event is very is a very hard discipline. It's apparently one of the hardest in the sport okay. because you need to have the ability of an eight hundred meter runner. Mm -hmm. um, for those that don't know who that, what that is, that's two laps around the track. And then, so it needs a lot of distance and cardio, but you also need to have the speed of a 400 meter, 200 meter guy, which is, you know, a, a top elite sprinter. So, you know, you start your season off with a strong base, you know, you're running, you're running, you're running a lot of miles, you're running a lot of miles. And, you know, you also have the, uh, which would be fine if you're an 800 meter runner. But remember, I have to go over an obstacle. Yeah. So we have to have we have to have a different element to just running. So I'm running, I'm running, but now we're going over hurdles. So now the whole first couple of months of your training just consists of building as much stamina as you can. Okay. Whether it's running with a weight jacket, whether it's running up hills, whether it's going over hurdles while doing 800 meters and 600 meter runs, and then when the season's about to start, it's like you do a whole 360 degree turn and you are a complete different athlete because now you have to focus on the sprinting aspect. Yeah. Aspect. So the distance gets smaller and the speed picks up. So now you're high intensity sprinting while still hurtling. Okay. <laughs> uh, they say that the hardest event in track and field is they, the 400 hurdles. They call it the man killer event wow. because uh, it is a huge sacrifice. It's, 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 and it's very taxing on the body and the amount of hours and training that goes into it just to run a 50 second race uh, is brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. And then it's so brutal that you accompany it's like a community, the mm -hmm. guys that run that event. When you guys are all done with the event, it's like you got, you can't help but hug each other. Cause it's like, wow, <laughs> I'm looking at this person. He, this person could be from Egypt. They could be from Brazil. Yeah. Um, but I, and I'm all in the U.S. But I know the time and effort that he put in to yeah. get to where I'm at. So we both put the amount of work in because we both know how much sacrifice it takes, how much uh, training hours it takes. The, the late night uh, studying of the races and going to sleep early to wake up early to train, the weight room workouts, you know, so we both know what it takes to get there. So it's a like huge mutual respect between us when you get to that point. And it's very taxing. To get to that level, you need a lot of discipline, mm -hmm. a lot of perseverance. And the, the, what I tell the youth and I would tell your community is uh, have a lot of support. That's why I love the fact that we're doing this because yeah. uh, it's showing that I'm supporting them as much as they want to support because I had a huge support system. There are times where you're going to feel like, this is it. I can't go another day of practice. But you have your family there, you have your friends, and you have your coach that are going to coach you and help you support you get there. Mm -hmm. Whether it's financially, whether it's motivationally, emotionally, whatever it is, have a strong support system because there are going to be times where you're going to want to quit and not keep going. And that person is going to be like, no, 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 come on. You know why you're doing this. And then that's going to push you forward. So I would, that's the biggest thing. If you could take anything out of this conversation I just had with you, that would be it. <laughs> That's incredible advice. And I think that there's some really good correlations here between what it takes to be an elite hurdler and some of the experiences that our teams are going through. You know, they've got multiple challenges that they have to be ready for, right? The robot has to do a wide variety of tasks. Uh, and there's uh, uh, you know, all kinds of challenges that come along the way. I think that perseverance and that passion that we're talking about is key. And then also, well, I love what you shared about the community because we see that in first as well. You know, there will be students who, when it's done, you know, you're hugging each other, you're celebrating, and, and that's just one of the best things to see, especially as a sponsor. You know, even countries who, you know, may be uh, at odds, right, but the students are right. there and they're going through these hard, important tasks, and they celebrate together regardless of what, you know, their countries may, may think of other countries. So it's good to see that kind of spirit, and I, I'm sure you've seen that as an Olympian as I well. think. I think, and you might not see, but it, like I said, robotics to me is almost like a sport, for so to speak. Anything that involves putting a team together to achieve a goal, it's time to kind of create a family. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the one that we can relate to is obviously x Long. We were yeah. both on it, and you weren't even on my season. Uh, I wasn't on season one. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on season five. But we've been through the obstacles. We've been through the weeks of the filming and all that stuff, so we know what it takes. And you can see how big the community is. Yeah, It's huge. Like Even the, the season now that I just finished – I feel like I know them personally, even though I've never met them mm -hmm. in person, because it's like, you know what that person went through those couple of weeks and on that filming and doing the show. So 
Absolutely. It's uh, that's what the community is, and that's kind of how the robotics community is. And I'm assuming that's uh, that's how sports is. And I'm assuming that's how the robotic community is. For sure, 100. percent So shout out and saludos to todo, todos los fans de Exatlón que están en la llamada. Shout out to all the Exatlón <laughs> fans that are on the call, and then everyone that you know, again, coming in from different countries, throw in the comments what country you're in from, um, what you know, your team uh, number is, and. And, you know, that part of the community is it's so important. And I feel that that is true with FIRST as well. You know, I've been to events in Australia and Singapore and Monterrey and had the opportunity to see that same energy and love everywhere. Um, but now I want to, you know, drive us towards a little bit of the growth of the sport and the, and the evolution of the sport. So it's one of the, the oldest sports, right? Running has been around since the beginning of time. Is there anywhere in the sport where you would say like people would be really surprised to see how much technology is is in there? You know, they may be familiar with running, but not really realize how much technology is in a certain aspect of of track and field. Uh, if you go look at some of the film from maybe the 1930s, or the 1940s, what track and field looked like, and if you look at it, what it is now you'd be surprised. Uh, you had high jumpers and pole vaulters going over poles and landing on cinders. Cinders are those little wood chips. Yeah. Um, you had uh, distance runners and track runners running on dirt, sometimes cinder and sometimes uh, different surfaces. And if you look at it now, completely different. You have mm -hmm. your, your foam mats, you have your synthetic tracks, the uniforms they wear, the, the track spikes they use, the equipment they use. Mm -hmm. um, and more importantly, the, the, the timing system that we use now is completely, completely different. Uh, so track and field in its own right is, is completely changed. And to me, it could still change for the better. There's still a lot of things that can be improved. Yeah. Um, and there's still things that are prehistoric, like um, wearing a bib number. Like I mentioned, <laughs> you know, a couple of ways, to, putting a bib number on with safety pins. That's pretty prehistoric. You would, you would think they've developed something new where it's like a sensor or something where I can put it on me and yeah. run by the finish line. It would register my number bib so you would know exactly who it was that crossed the line um, instead of me having a you know, put this number on it. I think at this point, I think at this point they do have something. I just think they do it for tradition. So you okay. have that, your logo and you have your name on there. Yeah. And obviously I like, I like to keep it because I, I still have mine from London. If you can see, yeah. I still have my, yes, there it is, my bib and stuff. And you get to keep those. So it's almost, it's almost nice to have, mm -hmm. uh, but they can give it to you and then you can put it on. But I wouldn't use that as a means to keep track of the athletes. I think yeah. they do. So yeah, for those who may not be super aware, the bib is just the number that the athlete wears uh, and it identifies the athlete. Sometimes it's a number, and depending on what sport and what level you're at. But you use safety pins to put it onto your jersey, right? So not only is it just this piece of paper that says this is who I am, and you know, like as if people don't know who you're saying Bolt is, right? and then right. at the same time you're using a very basic device to put it on. So for teams out there, if you're thinking of ideas to research for this season and you want some simple thing that, you know, may be very, um, how do I say it, like transformative in, in the way that we look at this, that's something that you can identify. You don't have to have this crazy new material for the track. You can even look at something as simple as how we identify athletes, how we track them, their times, um, you know, where is the best place to put it on an athlete. Um, and I just kicked my stand. <laughs> uh, just like things along those lines. That it's something that's it's just the way we've always done it, right? And, and there is some nostalgia to it. I think that's why you're mentioning some people keep it. And it is nice to hang up your bib. But maybe that's something we just hand the athletes. And one of these teams can come up with a really good idea of a better way of tracking the athletes and the times and, and all that. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. And then so what about somewhere you know and, and that may be one of your good examples but is there another area where you can think man this is just this has been the same way that we've always done it you know where is there really some areas that you feel are open for innovation still uh i guess the biggest one that i would say would would help innovate is uh ah uh, let's see hmm there's a couple. Mm -hmm. I think the 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 biggest one would be because we have the synthetic tracks. Okay. I think the timing system. The timing system can always be improved. Let, let's 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 start with the timing system because the timing system has obviously been something that has been improved since we started track and field. Because remember, we went from hand timing people. Yeah. <laughs> 
You know, we were hand timing, set go. We started timing when they cross the finish line. We time, and now we can get it up to the point zero zero one of a second. How they do it? Uh, so that system went from doing that to having a sensor that was like a line scan that mm -hmm. would just scan the line on the on the floor. Okay. Sorry, we went from that. We went from we went from a beam. We actually had a beam. So when the mm -hmm. gun would go off, the athletes would start, and when they would cross the beam, it would stop the clock. Okay. Uh, and then we went to the 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 laser beam that would cover the white track. And as you cross that, that was uh, based off the gun. So the gun had a little attachment to it. You still had the pistol, the gun would go off and that little sensor would sense uh, pressure change. Okay. When you felt the pressure change, then that would, the system would go off and that would start the time. You, it would obviously that would, you, the sensor would sense that faster than you can react to the gun mm -hmm. hearing the gun. So when you heard the shot, you would go. Okay. And then the, as you cross, now we have a fully automatic uh, timing system with cameras that catch the athletes as they cross the line, the beam mm -hmm. line. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we have a block. The block system, if anyone's aware, we athletes start on a block. The block is two pedals that we push off to start to accelerate ourselves to get going. Um, they're not pressure sensitive. So now we went from actually having a gun to um, electronic piece of equipment that push the button, it mm -hmm. tells the computer, and the computer sends a noise to the back of a loudspeaker that's installed on the back of the block. Okay. So instead of a loud gun, all you hear is a noise come out the speaker. Mm -hmm. When you hear that, you go. But so imagine this is the block, everyone. When I put my foot on it, I'm going to push. Mm -hmm. When I release, that's your reaction time. Okay. So what, the sensor catches this and pushes off. Now, if you do that too fast before the gun goes off, that's considered a false start. And that registers mm -hmm. in the computer. So if you look at the computer, you will see a bunch of green lines, everyone that's went out, and then you see a yellow line, that's the person who false started because they went before the gun actually went off. Okay. Um, but just like every system, Jay, you know how the science works and all this. Uh, it's not foolproof. Yeah. It can malfunction. Things can happen mm -hmm. that, uh, can affect the, um, that can affect the, the timing system. Someone can false start and not really have been done the false start, you know, anything could have happened. Yeah. So that can always be an improvement that we can look at. And that could uh, be the end of the Olympics for someone, right? There's, is it two false starts in your outfit usually? Yes, my teammate, God bless his soul, Javier Kulson, was my team at Foreign Hurdles. He trained for four years, got to the Olympic final and false started. Uh, and once you false start, you get one chance you're out. So imagine training for four years of your life, yeah. false starting. Inside, no, you didn't false start, but the machine is saying you did. So you're out. And also, always remember that athletes train based on the, the, the start of the gun to a noise. So truly, if you react faster than me and I react slower and you win the race, doesn't necessarily mean that you're technically faster than me. Mm, you, so could you, time. you just had a better reaction. Time. So could you imagine if we were able to time the athlete from the moment his foot actually came out the block as opposed yeah. to hearing the gun? Okay. And then we compare the time. It's kind of how they do it in drag racing. That's how they do it in drag racing. They, they base it on the, when the car moves as opposed to when it actually goes off. Um, that could be one. But the one innovation, I was talking to this with my teammates today because mm -hmm. I asked them about this idea, is, uh, and this would be pretty cool even for distance runners. There is a system that, th that they have out that's like a rabbit. It's a light. I can say, Jay, I want you to run this, this lap in like, 60 seconds. Okay. I can program it and the light will trail around the track mm. like a, a light and you'll see it. It's like a rabbit Yeah. In a, in a 60 seconds. But if I could develop a robotic system that was like a camera that went around the same way okay. because there are rabbits that exist like pace rabbits, you probably see it in horse races. But if I can develop a robotic system that followed you around mm -hmm. based on a sensor that you're wearing or something to catch your stride length, how fast you're moving, mm. uh, uh, measure your uh, measure Charlie, how fast you're moving, and I could program it to run a, a steady pace or run at your pace. It'd be amazing. Maybe not for some other events, but for my event, yeah. it's great because I'm a 400 hurdler. And sometimes you don't know what exactly happened between the hurdle. Like, okay, did my short? Did I short my stride? Did I did I get tired at the end? Yeah. Uh, the stride length was good. It's a great training tool because a lot of the times, a lot of these athletes have to travel, you know, to different mm -hmm. countries to run and they might not have their coach there. Yeah. But if I could take this system with me or have a, another go to university that has it and use it, mm -hmm. I could send that feedback, all that information to my coach and he can give me some online uh, um, coaching, which is even better now because obviously imagine if we had it now, we had that system where, hey coach, you can't come to the track because of COVID-19, but here's what yeah. I did. And he can Zoom coach me, he could coach me to the track with the Zoom. Yeah. 
you know, because he can actually physically see me going on my check. I think that's yeah. even, uh, an even better innovation. I think that's, there's plenty of stuff, not only in the, in the training world, but in the actual track world. Mm -hmm. I could say more because track and field is tons of events. There's pole vault, long jump, yeah. javelin, uh, 100, 200, long jump, high jump. There's tons of events mm -hmm. in each event can be improved each event can create some new innovation you yeah, know so. i i guess the, the coolest one we saw recently it was obviously at the olympic games uh the pole the shot putter would throw the ball mm -hmm. and they had a ro they had a mocha troll cart retrieve the ball for them and bring it back oh, so awesome. no it was yeah it was, a, it was a safety thing so obviously no one's out in the field worried yeah. about getting hit by the ball or anything and no one has to actually physically walk over that they just boom picks yeah. the ball and brings it right back to you okay yeah, so let me just, for, for those who don't know what shot put is, it's a large, it's what, it's like 18 pounds? How heavy is that? I don't remember. Is that too heavy? 16? 16 pounds, I think is 16 right. 16 pounds, yeah. Um, so they're throwing this large. huge ball, and it's, I don't know, I can't remember the numbers. I think in high school they were throwing like 70 feet. Is that right-ish? I can't remember. Either way, no, they're 70 feet, this very that's, heavy that's ball absurd. a very long distance. And then traditionally you would just have someone go and pick those up after in between throws but if someone's practicing or if a, a javelin comes in from another area a discus whatever you know these objects could literally kill you and so that's you know kind of a cool innovation there to see a, a remote control you know vehicle or a small robot go in and pick up those items um but you said a lot of really cool things and i want to go back to some of these because i think there's a lot of good ideas for teams to look into here and just really cool points of how much technology touches the sport that a viewer may just kind of take for granted. So for example, the blocks that you were talking about. So again, th those are the starting blocks that the athletes, usually sprinters, will come off of at the beginning of the race. So if you've ever watched the 100 meter dash, you'll see them all kind of crouch down at the start line and push off of those blocks. So now you all know that there's pressure sensors on there and a lot of your teams are using different types of sensors on your robot. So it's cool to see that that technology that you're using on your robot could be applied to things like this in, in track and field and in other sports. So literally what you told us there is that since you're, when you're putting the pressure on there, technology is touching the sport before you even start running, right? Which is kind Correct. of cool to, to see yeah. that there. So it literally is everywhere there. But my question that I want you to elaborate on that part is when you're training, um, is technology like that with the blocks, with the timing system, is that available to you in training or is that just way too expensive? Um, it's is, some of those work on like making it more accessible, maybe and making a technology that's similar, but less, less expensive. Yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, there's a 10, there's a system called 1080 sprint. That's a $20,000 piece of machine that no one's just walking around with $20,000 that <laughs> it measures your, your acceleration, you know, you tie it around your waist and you, you take off running and it measures how fast you're running. It can pull you to run at a certain rate. Uh, it lets you know which, which leg you, you're putting more pressure on, if you're putting more pressure to your left or your right, okay. where there's some imbalances in your performances that they can fix and you can fix all that. But like I said, it's a $20,000 machine. The people that can afford this are like maybe huge university programs, yeah. um, huge track clubs, stuff, stuff like that. But as an individual athlete, you know, they say track and field, you would just need a, a pair of spikes or some shoes and go out and run, like old school, you know. Yeah. But uh, you would be at a disadvantage by not having this machine. You see a lot of these universities not purchasing it. You know, with, if you're not using the technology that's offered to you to improve you as an athlete, I think you're at a huge disadvantage. Yeah. And like this, like I said, this stuff isn't accessible. You got to think of a pole vault pole. It's a, there's a piece of fiberglass and it costs, what, $600 a pole? Wow. It's ridiculous. So if you yeah. need two poles, and a set of pole vault for an athlete is probably like six or seven poles that they use to compete with. Not to mention there may be their, their other three that they might have extra or the ones they use to practice with, even though they practice with the ones they compete with sometimes. But for the most part, you're looking at spending about three grand, $3,500 on a set. Okay. So if there's something that you can use to, uh, to improve that, that, technology in the sport while keeping it accessible to an athlete without losing your mind that mm -hmm. that's always a benefit that's yeah. not that's not that's always a benefit for everyone okay so teams out there if you're if you can look into different ways to um you know work on timing systems work on pressure sensors on blocks at a way that you know that's a much lower cost point for athletes uh, i think that's a cool project for some of you to work on and then the materials cost for for poles 
I had never thought about that. I mean, um, you know, obviously I, I figured they go through several and they have several, but I would have never thought that they were that expensive. So by lowering the cost of that, you can increase access to, this, to that sport significantly, I'd, I'd say. Um, the other thing you mentioned that I loved, and I would love to see this, I, I, you know, as a distance runner, I would love to see this. And I think any kind of athlete that's out there um, and would love to see how their body is working or what they do during a race to see where you can improve, either the, the kind of the tracking system that, that you were talking about. So for those who don't, didn't know what a rabbit is, a rabbit is usually an athlete that's on the track to help pace the other athletes towards a, a particular goal time. Um, so you might see a race where it's a, a 5 k race and there's someone that's there just for the first mile or two miles pacing those athletes out to, to go after that kind of time goal. And so I think the version you're talking about also has like a camera and has some sensors and can analyze. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a super event. Now, now, I mentioned it, but it's not technology that doesn't exist. There's already a, a system that's a, a rabbit system that goes around the track that, that, that's like a tracking system. Yeah. It's not a track. It's like a track system that they put a rabbit on. Literally and goes yeah, I think the, the I think the Nike facility, the Nike facility in Oregon has one where it's a light beam and the light goes around the track at a pace, whatever you set it on. Okay. Mine goes a little more in depth because like I said, an athlete around the track for my event starts to fade. Your stride link gets shorter as you get tired. As a, from a coach perspective, I can see you decelerating. Mm -hmm. But if I can measure the velocity, how fast you went out, where you started decelerating and why your stride link fell, okay. I'm at a huge advantage because I can be like, oh, if you just maintain this stride link, you know, at this part of the race as opposed to this part, you'll still have enough energy and efficiency to finish the race at this part, especially with my race, because one of my idols is uh, Edwin Moses. Mm -hmm. Edwin Moses was a U.S. runner. He was back in the 80s. Uh, a little before I'll maybe the people watch this time back in the eighties, he was a, he was an athlete that did my event and he went 10 years without losing. He had a 10 years being straight because he had a huge instinct. You know, he had 39 inch instinct mm -hmm. and he would take, and he was a physicist. So nice. science was in his blood, you know, and that's why I mentioned him. And his idol. <laughs> I love it. He was a physics major and that's all he ever thought about. So he said, how can I apply what I know in physics to what I do? And that's exactly what he did. He said, my stride efficiency would be 13 steps between each hurdle getting to the finish. If I do that, no one can beat me because no one has my stride frequency or my stride length. Yeah. And he did just that. He, developed, he changed the race completely. Everyone went from running 14 to 15 steps in all chain to just running a 13-step stride pattern all the way around, okay. which made him more efficient. Yeah. And he realized if I could do this and I can maintain uh, that stride length, then I can win every race. And that's what he was doing for like 10 years. Wow. And then he, after he did that, he realized, okay, now I got the science behind it. What's it going to take for me to do that? And he was able to apply it to his training. Yeah. I got to get more, I got to build more stamina. I got to get faster. These are where my, my strategy gets short so I can build up. I mean, it's, it, you can see how science applying it to the sport can help. They helped him <laughs> go 10 years out and, and make, you know, so yeah, I think that, that, this, that, 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 system i was talking about it's a little advanced a little crazy it does sound like a fifty thousand dollar system or something crazy but it there are cameras that are going to track if you've been watching the nba finals um mm -hmm. you see the sideline cameras the way they use oculus which would be awesome if your coach could watch you with an oculus system from home because he can't yeah. reach you or whatever because he's sick and he could literally watch you run uh these ideas are just flowing in my head no, i don't have the funds for it nor do i have the brains nor do i have the brains to begin to know what I would have to put together to develop it, but well, well, that's sure there's a lot of kids out there ball, too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have the students here that are going to be able to come up with these concepts. I'm, I'm so glad that you made those analogies too. One, that's exactly what this changing the game series is all about is uncovering how science physics, like the example you gave can make the world a better place in the world of sports, whether that's making athletes better, making the sport more accessible, making it more fun for people to watch and you know as a spectator i think it's it's great that you showed a good example of someone who literally used physics and what he knew about it his his major athlete without really his major anything about himself yeah. right his mate no his, his major was physics and industrial engineering oh, there so, you go. <laughs> so he just he just applied everything he knew about what he loved because that was his passion track yeah. fell afterwards That's and applied awesome. to that and you see how it achieves. So I think if you could develop something like that, and they can, they can figure it out. But you probably will make. You could probably develop the next Olympic uh, gold medalist. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, students, just take that to heart. I hope you guys really heard and felt that because 
what you are working on this season that's specifically around fitness and sports and play can make the world a better place for so many people and can make you know these athletes perform at a whole new level that we never even thought of as possible um i want to go to a comment here quick that says do you guys have these awesome interviews somewhere i can watch them if i can't do live yes we put them on uh youtube uh right after the call it'll be up on youtube so you can definitely go back and re look at some of uh, the ideas that Eric mentioned, if you want to go back and, and listen really deeper into some of the things that you heard that you might want to uh, develop further. We also had someone say hello from Russia, where it is 4 a.m. right now. So shout out to... Shout Russia. out to Russia. <laughs> shout out to everyone watching. Uh, there's a lot of people saying hello. I didn't get a chance that I was blabbing on my mouth, but hello to everyone watching. I appreciate you guys. Uh, saludos a toda la gente de Puerto Rico, la gente que me está pidiendo que habla español. Sí, estamos aquí, los puertorriqueños representando eh, a todos los latinos que están ahí viendo. Eh, it's, it's nice to be able to share this time with Jay. I'm, I'm glad he brought you. This is really fun, actually. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm having a lot of fun. So Happy. let's keep it going. <laughs> yeah. Gracias a todos. Um, yeah, no, I, I think you've been giving some really fun examples that, you know, students may not have really thought of uh, on their own if you don't have that experience of being the athlete or of d digging deeper into these sports. So. I think that's, um, you know, very valuable and I appreciate that from your perspective. Um, let's go into like spectating and, you know, how people view and see the sport. I know I've seen at the Olympics sometimes, especially in the faster events, there's sometimes a camera on the, um, on a track, right? I've seen, I think one year, didn't you say bulk get tripped by a guy in a Segway? Um, yeah. <laughs> that was on the yeah. camera or something. There's, there's. Wide, I'm sure a wide variety of ways that they capture the uh, kind of excitement and energy of the sport. But is there anything that you think is one, either really cool in the way that they do it already, or two, an area that you think you can be improved so that more people can be brought into the sport and, and be excited by it and potentially even inspire younger students to you know, uh, pursue track and field? I, I, I honestly, I, I think you're starting to see it a little more. Uh -huh. The biggest problem I think track and field has is that people only recognize track and field as a four-year event. Okay. Every, when the Olympics comes around, okay, this is track and field. Everyone that's when, it. that's our World Series. That's when we're on the main stage and nobody yeah. else cares about any other sport except what Usain Bolt's doing or what this person's doing in track and field because you see it for te two weeks straight, oh, that's all you see on TV is yeah. what this person did. So that's like our World Series or our, our championship. Mm -hmm. Even though track and field has seasons, we have the Diamond League, we have a bunch of events that go on every year. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very predominant in the U.S., but if you live in, you know, Europe, they have a lot of track league events, mm -hmm. um, you know, just in Asia, wherever they have more access to track and field because it's more of a popular sport yeah. over there than it is in the U.S. U.S., we have football and basketball and stuff. But yeah. um, to answer your question, to get people more involved, it, it's obviously we just got to use track and field has to use this resource. Mm -hmm. uh, we use resources just like every other sport is happening. I think the, 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 the track and field body who is in charge of the sport um, doesn't really do a good job of it at the moment. We are, there's a bunch of track athletes right now um, called We Are Sports that are developing, um, I said We Are the Sport is what it's called. We're developing a, a, almost like an athlete union mm -hmm. to really represent what the track and field is and hopefully bring more viewers in because not a lot of people know what pole vault is. Not a lot of people see yeah. javelin as a sport, but those, uh, those events exist, but we don't get access to it. We don't watch it. Yeah. Um, but the more and more you see, uh, if you were able, to, unfortunately, the Olympics wasn't this here. But I encourage everyone who's watching that when you watch the, the, um, the Olympics, not just watch it for the sport, just to see how fast you're saying, well, one of these guys runs, but see the technology that goes into putting this entertainment to bring it to your TV. Um, I was watching the NBA finals the other day, and it literally, they have a sideline cam now. Okay. Where it literally looks like you're standing on the court with them. Like you're the ref. I don't know yeah. if you've seen it. It looks like you're in the video game where you're watching it. Yeah. And they tell me this is for an Oculus system. And immediately as I thought that, I was like, can you imagine if I can put that on one of these track athletes mm -hmm. in the starting block where you could put the Oculus on and literally be standing next to Usain Bolt and race? <laughs> or, be, or be Usain Bolt, put it yeah. on, and you get to see Usain Bolt, and then you can feel what he's feeling at that moment in time, whether it's a semifinal, whether it's a final, you know, whatever it is, or you could put it on me and, and I'll run with it around the track so you can see what it feels yeah. like to actually run the event. Or, you know, anything that can help you engulf the, the, mm -hmm. the program, whether it's, you know, getting more involved with social media, uh, making the event more lively, 
bringing the crowd back in. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the sport, I think all sports are going to suffer now because of social distancing and everything that's going on with the pandemic. But we're, we want it. We're encouraged. We just can't wait. A lot of people can't wait to get back to the concert halls to watch concerts. We can't wait to get back to the arena so we can watch, you know, rest. And we can't wait to get back to the arena so we watch baseball, soccer, whatever it is, so we can fill the stadium up and we can hear the cheers and the scream. Like, we're, we want that. We're, we're, we're fighting for it. And if we could find a way to bring that to you even better than we're already doing with the Zoom and all these other programs, um, I think that's the goal. I, I, I think that's the goal for everyone. Make it a spectacular every time there's a track event, music, uh, whether it's, you know, building some type of uh, electronic system. Yeah. I was watching the World Championships. They now have these little laser cameras where they do this amazing light show at the beginning of every event that mm -hmm. lights the track up. It's almost like they use a track as a, as a, as a white screen to put a movie on or something. It's, That's cool. it's pretty, so I would, I would encourage people to, to, to watch that and see what technology that went into that to do that. But I, the one thing would be the marketing. We want to market the, the sport just like a real team was and, and allow the athlete to be able to sponsor themselves just like everyone else mm. because the track and field world doesn't allow you to use your sponsor. So every four years we go out there and everyone's watching, you know, you see your McDonald's commercial, you see all these commercials, but you know, we're not getting any revenue off that. And we, if, if the track athlete's happy, because we do it as a passion, we're yeah. passionate about it. And you, it, it, it's, just, it's completely displayed. Uh, if, if the viewer is able to access that and feel that same emotion that person feels, Mm -hmm. um, the same way you feel when you're watching the World Cup and Team USA makes a goal or your country makes a goal because there's people from Egypt when Egypt scores a goal or Brazil <laughs> scores a goal, your country goes crazy and you feel it. If we can get that interaction where when you same boat crosses that finish line and you can feel that same intensity and that feel that he feels, I think everybody will be in that sport. And then you as a guy's like, I want to do that. I want to provide that for my country. So that will encourage you to come do the sport. It's It's shameful that the sport isn't as popular as it should be in many in, in the U.S. and other countries. Remember, because soccer is the number one participated sport in the world. Mm -hmm. Number two is track and field. Oh, participated wow. by yeah. you. It's a relatively cheap sport. All you need is a pair of shoes and your body to go out and run. You know, you don't have to buy expensive equipment. Unless you want to be a pole vault, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, other, than that, uh, other than that, it's relatively cheap, but we want to encourage you. Everybody loves running yeah. from a young age. You want to get out and run. Exactly. Uh, a lot of sports use running as a punishment, you know, <laughs> go, yeah. go run some laps. And I think that's where the discourage is like, I don't want to run. But, you know, that's that another, way. if we could go back to when I was, to the story where I mentioned about growing up, that yeah. was another thing. Whenever I would show up late for a practice for basketball, football, you know, whatever I was playing, and they say, go run, I thoroughly enjoyed running. Like, that's I thoroughly fun. say, go run two laps. I would go and run. You know? <laughs> so I think that was another passion. Just, you know, stay in track and field. This is your sport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, at, at running distance, I was like, yeah, our, your punishment is what we do as our, our normal sport. Yeah. So it's an interesting sport that we enjoy that kind of uh, challenge. But um, uh, definitely for the the football and soccer comment in there, we've got definitely some, some countries that are heavy hitters in those sports. So uh, some love for them. I want to touch on one of the questions we got from uh, a team in advance uh, when we put it out on the Instagram stories. So um, if anyone else has any other questions, definitely throw them into um, the, the question thing here. And let's go, it'll pop up right here. So this is FRC team oh. 49, 44. I, I took a look at them before the call. They're out of the United Arab Emirates. So another global team uh, that, you know, put in some love here. So do you think there will ever be an Olympic style robotics competition like racing, lifting, et cetera? So we've talked about how there might be robotic cameras, there might be all these sensors and stuff, but do you think that we'll actually have robots uh, on the track or, or maybe not, but in any other sport? I absolutely believe, and I'm pretty, I'm really sure that okay. there will be some type of an Olympic type robotics competition. Okay. Um, what I believe, what I want, whether I want to believe it or not, uh, <laughs> technology is literally taking over the world. Do you uh, view it as I, like I? It's a good the same uh, sport, or do you view like a separate robotics competition at the Olympics? How do you? I review a separate robotics competition. Okay. Olympic style, where yeah. every country enters their best robotic team mm -hmm. to bring out their best robotic inventions, and there'll probably be different categories. Mm -hmm. um, there might be. Uh, you know, depending on what the robotics they built, mm -hmm. like an actual robot or a, 
or maybe the the mini robots you guys build. I believe I've seen competitions where you guys lift things and you know battle each other, a battle royale robots as well. Um, those are always exciting to watch. People will love watching that. Anything that you can pull and and market and to get people's attention. Yeah. Um, even though that's not the ultimate goal, when you have a passion, is not you, you do it because you love it, not because yeah. you're trying to make any money out of it. But you know, if to pull networks in and people to want to include into being Olympic to be the, uh, to do this Olympics of robotics, I think it's absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. Another thing is uh, technology is so advanced, you will start to see um, veterans mm. that may have lost a limb. Yeah. Um, in war or you know in an accident, people who yeah. may have lost an in it. Um, robotics is very included. I saw the other day uh, uh, Jeff Bezos was trying out uh, the, the CEO of Amazon trying out this robot where he puts the things on and he sh he goes like this and the robot does it and he shakes someone's hand and the robot reaches out and shakes hands so he can control right. the robot which would be pretty cool if we can develop a robot where we could do it and we can actually box but the robot will be boxing <laughs> against the other robots, kind of like this movie. I forgot what the movie is called, where the guy controls the robot. He's a boxer, uh, controls the robot, and the robot's yeah. fighting. I think it's, it's I do. real steel. So I think. Yes, yeah. real steel. I physically, I could, pop, I could literally see that in the future as an okay. Olympic sport, whether it's something I'm doing. Uh, yeah, and then let's say like uh, a veteran who lost his leg during the Paralympics, he's running with a robotic leg. Yeah, absolutely. We can include that in the Robots Olympics. Uh, uh, it could be racing. It could be lifting, like you said, anything that has to do with robotics is straight that. How fast can we get this robot to go, whether it's, okay. you know, a robot shaped like a dog or, or something crazy. <laughs> uh, but absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. If it's there and the idea is there and the fact that you mentioned it, that means it exists. That yeah. means someone thought it up. So eventually it's just finding the right people to put it together. But yeah, okay. absolutely. Awesome. So first of all, shout out to Amazon because they just became a strategic partner of first supporting uh, teams globally, so that's it's good to hear. Um, that is awesome. Then, I actually, I actually work for Amazon. I don't know if you mentioned yet. <laughs> yeah. I do work for Amazon. I do work in one of their hard work, uh, warehouses, so I get to see their robotics in person. I get to see how they build the QR codes and the robots move and bring items to everyone. It's it's pretty technology. Amazon is a is a great company to work for as far as uh, when you want to see how. As far as IT is concerned, because you get yeah. to develop their new technologies and everything, and they've got a nice compensation for it too. And if you have a great idea, and you can shoot it to Amazon, and they take that idea, mm. you never know. You could be the next uh, <laughs> a creator of Amazon or some system that they use. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, so shout out to Amazon. But then also you brought up you know Paralympics and prosthetics and other ways that we hadn't necessarily talked about earlier in the conversation. But there's you know athletes with all different types of um, you know abilities and needs that technology can help improve their experience in the Olympics. Or I think even just like you mentioned, someone, maybe someone that can't even move, uh, out of, but could somehow participate in, in a sport in that way, you know, kind of like the, the robot idea you're talking about, but, you know, some kind of system that allows them to have that feeling of Correct. competing, even though they may not be able to physically. I think there's some really cool things that teams could work on there. And, and again, that goes back to what we've been talking about with ac access to these type of opportunities. Yeah, awesome. So one thing I want to um, touch on also is the, the gear you wear, right? So shoe technology, you talked about the track spikes. For someone who's never put on a pair of track spikes or, or hasn't competed on a synthetic track, what, what have you seen in that space? And or do you have any ideas for teams there? Oh, I've, you got, first, just look at the t-shirt you're wearing. It's probably a dry fit. That's a technology that started where it's, uh, we wanted to soak up the sweat or help you breathe a little bit so you're not suffocating when you're wearing regular cotton. Mm -hmm. The track spike, the materials they use, it, it seems like they use less and less material every time, okay. but it's a strong material. So they, mm -hmm. we lessen the material, but it's stronger. Um, it's lightweight. So we can use it on a track because we want to be light. And uh, the way it's shaped and designed is always to to help the athlete perform better. And you've seen it over the years, how fast these athletes gotten. Uh, the biggest advancement you see, you mentioned was the synthetic track. The track used to go with, from like cinders, from like concrete to cinders, and it was like this rubbery bit stuff. And now it's called uh, a company called Mondo, mm -hmm. who makes this, uh, this synthetic track that's like about that thick, okay. and it rolls out like carpet. Oh. So it pretty much just comes in these huge rolls and they roll it out, and then they mark the lines on the track and they paint them on. 
uh, but it's like a rubberized, super synthetic track. And then when you dig your spikes into it, obviously it propels you, propels you forward faster, yeah. um, creating these ridiculously fast times. I just saw you saying ball and these guys run. So mm -hmm. that you didn't see way in the past that were obviously at a disadvantage because they didn't have that technology. Yeah. Uh, but you see it. You see it in the clothes. Um, a big advancement in an idea, if someone wants to, to take it, we go right ahead. Uh, I may have seen it. I may not have seen it somewhere, but it, it came to my brain. As you mentioned, the sheet, the clothing we wear. Um, I live in South Florida. I sweat a lot. Okay. If I'm able to wear a t-shirt that can alert me and let me know, hey, you're dehydrated. You lost this much sweat. That's a huge investment. Whether it's, whether it's the in, embedded in the, the, the fabric of the cotton or whatever, mm -hmm. and it tells me I'm going to stop on my watch. Hey, you've lost this much sweat. You need to hydrate or you're close to a stroke. You've been watching soccer games. Unfortunately, in the sport of soccer, you know, you've seen accidents where people have over had, had strokes because they were dehydrated or severely or passed away on the field because they were mm -hmm. over dehydrated. If I can develop a jersey, a soccer jersey that has a synthetic uh, material that lets me know, hey, you need to calm down because you're about yeah. to, you're dehydrated, you're about to have a stroke or it, it, it could sense your heart rate accelerating. Mm -hmm. It could sense your health, you know, as you're performing to keep you from getting hurt or you lost a lot of sweat, you're a high risk of pulling a hamstring because you lost a lot of sweat or you're mm -hmm. a high risk of doing this. I think that would be a huge investment in clothing. I don't know how much that shirt would cost, <laughs> but I think that would be pretty, pretty good. I think as far as clothing, it could be with shorts, shirts, mm -hmm. socks, like lightweight fabric sock, uh, sock, whether it could be in the shoes to let you know, okay, you need to change your shoes. Yeah. They are completely worn out. You know, if you keep wearing these, you're facing having shin splints. Uh, getting uh, stretch fractures in your feet, stuff like that, to let you know, okay, these shoes are worn out, and I'll time to change them. That's Those little minor stuff like that is like stuff like people who normally wouldn't think about. I was like, yeah, but hey, that would be pretty good because I mean I've seen it in the sport, and obviously just you know you got you got a in Formula One, in Formula One, a track a, a race car, mm -hmm. there is when that race starts, there's like. 50 engineers watching these screens and they're all watching well, how the car is performing, whether the car is performing fast, if it's overheating, well, how the tires are doing. Mm -hmm. There's so much that goes into that. And these engineers are there watching everything. So if I can build a fabric on my body that can engineer someone watching me saying, hey, mm -hmm. let's come back on your training. You're getting hot or, you know, your heart rate's a little accelerated today or, you know, something like that obviously would improve your training as well. Even in a race, uh, a distance runner, a marathon runner who's running 26 miles, they hey, He's losing a lot of sweat. Or, oh, bro, you're fine. You don't, you're good. You can skip mm -hmm. this uh, rest stop. Keep going. Your body's going to do okay. Just get to the next water station. Drink water then. Yeah. You know, you'd prove times. You'd prove a lot of things. Uh, someone will keep track of that on a computer for you while you ran. It's just an idea someone can take. I'm not going to keep going into it because then they're going to start telling all my good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, this is great. And literally, it could save lives. Because like you said, there have been uh, like high school football students who just pass out on the field and die because – of dehydration and, and overworking their body and so i think the way that you're explaining it seems like a very high tech way but it could maybe be simple as your shirt turns a certain color once it's absorbed a certain amount of uh sweat i uh, just teams can you guys can start going wild on what this can be and, and we do have teams on here that are, are younger you know our first lego league students who you know they have 10 15 years they can start working on these ideas and the technologies will continue to grow and change so I team love angola okay oh, nice team angola is in the house hey <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. awesome i think we've touched every continent except for uh antarctica on this call so <laughs> that's that's good <laughs> um so we've touched on some really cool ideas that i think teams can go back to and start kind of brainstorming maybe some solutions on some of the ones that uh stood out most to them if if you if they had like if you had a magic wand you could say hey first team go and build me this for my you know for this sport or for my career um, what would that be and it, it could is it one of the ones that you've already talked about or is there something else you can even think of again don't think about current restrictions don't think about you know what you think is possible now because these students are going to be working on these ideas for years to come so if they had a you know one thing that they could help you bring to this sport, what would you want? 
Oh, for me, for my, for my special purpose. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> obviously, that that video camera system that I mentioned with the yeah. that can measure your style length and everything that would be very beneficial. But honestly, just to keep it simple, the one thing I hate after a long day of training is picking up hurdles. Okay. I hate going around the track yeah. to pick them up. If I had a robotic system, I could just program and go say, go pick up the the thing will go around the track, pick up all the hurdles, and it would measure out exactly where they're. Where you have to put them and everything. Yeah. I don't even have to tell them. Hey, I need this many hurdles. <laughs> put them down. Meet you out there. The, the goal instead of the coach marking off the distance of how far and rolling with the with the measuring stick, measuring where the hurdles go. No, just program it. The robot goes and puts it all down and puts them down and they go. And at the end of the day, pick up all the hurdles. It goes right back around track and picks them all up. <laughs> this is such a <laughs> good like, idea that I kind of like a Roomba. Think. I think some of our FRC teams and FTC teams <laughs> are like capable of doing that right now. So I. I am so glad you said that because it's simple, but could save so much time and oh. energy and that you facility waste managers, <laughs> facility managers would buy it. People would just buy because it's the, the way we pick up hurdles nowadays is very, very, very uh, retro. You just grab the yeah. hurdle, put it on a, on a, on a, sh uh, a make a cart. Cause no one's developed a great cart to put hurdles on yet. It's like <laughs> makeshift. We just put it on there. We roll them and we roll them and roll them. Uh, we could just have a system where I could just load it. That does let it do its job, right. and then at the end of the day, let it do a job, and I can walk around. And because you don't want to pick up hurdles when you're tired, and your coat okay. tired to left. So. You already destroyed your body, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, I gotta go pick up hurdles. <laughs> let's go into this. This one gets me really excited because it may be the same one of the simpler ones, but I think teams could really go after this. So I'm saying, what's that? At the Olympic Games, at the Olympic Games, they have a team. They have the hurdle crew. Is what we call them. The hurdle crew is in charge of just that, yeah. putting down the hurdles. There's a team at the end of the race, in charge of at the end of, at, this yeah, race. they are trained that at the end of this, at the end of this 400, it comes the, the 110 hurdles, which is the one, 110 hurdle race. They go and they put their hurdles out and they measure it and they, they put it down. Okay. But if we had a robot that did that in the Olympic Games, you're watching the Olympic Games, when they go to commercial, you see the robot in the background just putting the hurdles out, coming down, putting <laughs> them down, and putting them down. And you're like, it's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. So let's give them an idea. How many hurdles are in a 400 uh, race and how many are in the 110? It's 10 hurdles in both races. Okay. So for mine, races but minor, yeah, minor spaced out 35 meters apart. Yeah. And the 110, I think they're like seven, seven to eight meters. I'm not really sure. I have to go back. Okay. So that's not my race, but yeah. So for teams that might want to go into this, you would need to design it and build a robot that could um, carry, how, how tall are the hurdles? Uh, not at all because they can go down. They go down everything from 30 inches. Then you raise them up to 42 inches. Okay. Uh, How tall the are they would... during your event? They're 36 inches. Okay. So it's a 36 inch hurdle, um, and you're spacing 10 of them around a 400 meter track, right? So the robot would be able would need to identify where it's at on the track, maybe from the start line, and then go and space these appropriately across the, the track in the different lanes. And then after the event is over, go grab them and, you know, pick them up at those different locations potentially reset them for a different event like the 110 um, or take them away somewhere for storage now i will tell you this this is a funny story i was a, a running i was running a race okay and i took off running and we went over the second hurdle i mean over the first hurdle and then we got to where the second hurdle was supposed to be <laughs> and they didn't put it down okay They've so I was like, and so we just they just completely went. missed it. Oh, they okay. completely omitted it. We're like, we we ran past like, wait, where is it? So we all stopped running. Like, where's the second hurdle? Yeah. They forgot to put it down. Okay. So that if we had that robot, maybe it wouldn't have forgot because yeah. it knew how to put ten hurdles. I was like, hey, I'm missing the hurdle. Yeah, as long as they code it right, the robot should do it right. So as long as they code it, as long as it knows they put ten hurdles down, it's gonna give you an error. Hey, I only put nine. And you're like, yeah, I only yeah. put nine. It's missing one. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's on. Okay, so be able to do that for the 410 and then, or 400 meters and then um, have settings for like the 100 meters. So that's, a, you know, it's going to be different distances and a different part of the track. Um, and then do you often, like I've seen hurdlers kind of practice with a few and like do warm-ups. Are those usually yes. like, um, like I've seen someone, I forgot, you know, A skips and B skips in, in warm-ups. Yeah. Kind of doing that, but like alongside the hurdles, do you guys usually have them at certain distances? Or is that just kind of depends on the athlete on how you like to warm up and do drills? It depends on the athlete. Okay. We usually mark it off with our feet. So the, the, when it's like that, between it, we'll just pop like five feet. 
you know, but if you can you put five feet in there, but I mean, if it's a, one of those type of things where you're asking, if you're asking because you want to know if the program can program, I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. if I can program the robot, hey, put these hurdles, space them out five feet apart. Yeah. And the robot can go put them five feet apart. Then yeah, then I could do my drills that way or space them out. I I'm training, but I want the hurdle to be a little closer because I want to feel that I'm up on it yeah. so I can react faster going over it. So put the hurdle in an extra two meters. And if it goes out and puts it in two meters, I don't have to mark it with my feet. You know, okay. I can go and do it and know exactly where it's at. And it measures it to the T as opposed to me guessing up. Yeah, I think this is about 35 feet right there. <laughs> yeah. so. I love it. So, yeah, first of all, shout out to Team 2852 High Voltage. But for, for FRC teams and FTC teams out there, even some of the League teams out there, um, I think this is an idea that's pretty exciting that you guys have the skills to, to make happen. And as Eric was mentioning, both the athletes would love it, facilities and events that are, you know, trying I would to, love it. to put these <laughs> yeah, do it for together. Me. <laughs> yeah, do it for Eric. But I think a lot of other people would, would enjoy it as well. Um, and events that are trying to make their event move quicker, more smoothly, um, avoid errors. I think, you know, you could easily adjust the robot to do the 400, set up the 110 event, uh, pick up the hurdle. So... Welcome back. What did you do there? You scared me. I thought I was the only talking. I, I let it, I let everyone know that, hey, if Jay's froze, is nowhere, I'm still here. I still got you guys' back. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Uh, Dibu Rome was calling me, actually. Um, so, yeah, so so you guys have that, you know, great idea that I know you all have the skills to work on today and that could um, have an impact, you know, r really quickly in the sport uh make it you know, more enjoyable so you don't have to pick them up <laughs> and, and stuff like that and then could then be programmed to set up at different distances for drills and practice and training uh things of the sort um so i really hope teams will go after that if the, if a team does try to create a prototype um are, are you cool with them like tagging you and saying hey this is what we're working on what do you think can they send absolutely you ideas or questions Tell me, tell me. You know what? Okay. Tell me because I know that I won't. I will. I have a hurdle community too that follows yeah. me, and I, I follow a lot of hurdlers, and they will also, like, like, whoa, we need that. Yeah, give me that because I'm not. I know that I'm not. One, one of the hardest thing is, um, like I said, when you're done with practice, is picking up the hurdles. Nobody wants to pick them up, but nobody wants to put them down. Yeah. My coach calls me and says, "Hey, I need you to put down five hurdles," and I'm like, oh. which means I got to <laughs> get to the track earlier before my warm up and put the hurdles down. And then some of the tracks, all tracks are different. And if you're training at a high school track, that high school track might not have the the markings on the floor for the 400 meter hurdles. Okay. So then you're like, okay, now I have to grab a, a measuring stick and measure each 35 meters for each one. If I had that, this boom, put it down. Mm -hmm. know, that would save a lot of time. Yeah, that's awesome. I really hope teams, I hope that you will all consider um, going after that problem. And, and all the other ones that we mentioned. So we've had the idea for um, identifying how much sweat has left your body during practice so that we can keep people um, safe. We have the idea of picking one. up the hurdles. I think, I think that would really hit home for a lot of people, especially for the elderly people who live in South Florida and hot communities. Mm -hmm. that, that's a really good one. Yeah. We've talked about um, you know, how robotics could impact kind of the um, Paralympics. We've talked about the materials of the track and the shoes. Um, what else? We, we've had a lot of really good ideas, I think, that have come out of this. I hope that you all consider some of them um, as potential projects and, and even the way that um, kind of people are viewing the sport. And so whether it's for directly impacting track and field or outside, I think some of these ideas, too, can help make the world a better place for just the general population Absolutely. as well. Because um, a lot of these ideas can, 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 can extend and reach out, not just to track and field, but to other sports as well. Yeah. Um, and they can integrate, you know, you'd be developing something that can, you know, because if I can measure your stride length while you're running, then I can measure your jump shot while you're jumping. I can do a lot of yeah. things. You know, there's a lot of things that that, that system can capably do because okay. imagine running 100 meters as fast as Usain Bolt does, but we can actually watch him do it and measure, you know, everything that's going on. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I love all these ideas. I really hope teams will go after it. But I want to ask you just one last question and a piece of advice for the students. In terms of 
just perseverance. I, I know you mentioned this is one of the most difficult sports. Um, regardless of what sport you're in, becoming an Olympian twice is definitely not an easy uh, feat. And I know it takes it wasn't. a lot of commitment and time and good days and bad days. And so for these teams that are trying to literally change the world because their innovations are going to be, you know, they're going to be changing the way that we look at the world in these areas. What tips or advice do you have them on persevering? And, and on top of that, during this year when we've got all the different kind of things that we're being hit with in 2020. So uh, I'd love to hear your perspective as a multi, you know, time. It, Olympian. It, it, I'm glad you mentioned that, 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 that making the Olympic team twice is, 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 is feeding his own because mm -hmm. making the second Olympic team was probably one of the hardest things I had to go through in, in a sense of perseverance yeah. because uh, I didn't qualify for the Olympics till the penultimate race. Okay. Okay. So you you have to qualify for the Olympics for my event. Um, since I don't run for Team USA, I run for Puerto Rico. All I need to do is hit the standard. But I still hit, need to hit the standard so I can go because there's an A standard. Now, the yeah. standard is a time, a qualifying time you have to run. Uh, and I would rate, and you have to do it during a race. Mm -hmm. So I would race and race and race and race. I must have run like 20 races that season. And I didn't wow. hit the race to the final opportunity to qualify. The week prior to that, I had given up on myself. I said, no, nah, I guess I'm not going. I let myself down. I was almost in tears. I was crying. I was flushed frustrated as well as everyone can do because imagine remember all the time and hard work I put into that season mm -hmm. I remember all the 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 times bending over and throwing up from the hard workouts I remember you know the sweat I put in the yeah. everything everything the, the early morning wake-ups and the the, the the evenings I missed out with my friends because I knew I had to train the next morning mm -hmm. um and I remember just the encouragement of everybody around me saying oh you can do it you can do it you can do it and I want to say that that's what helped Okay. But it wasn't until I sat back and told myself, if it doesn't happen, it's okay. Mm -hmm. There's no problem with failing. Okay. If you don't make the team, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. You just won't make the team. It's okay. That's just going to make you stronger. Mm -hmm. So all the encouragement and telling people, telling me, yeah, you could do this way. Maybe you should try this. You should do it this way. Don't worry. You'll hit it on the next run. Mm -hmm. Kind of put a lot of pressure on me. It's kind of like I, I didn't want to let them down now. You yeah. know? And then... Till I, till you know, a sports psychologist that I saw the week prior to my last race told me, you know what? Forget about it. Mm -hmm. What's the worst that can happen? You fail, but that's it. You're not letting anybody down. You're going to be okay. And I think the next race I went out ran one of my fastest times ever. Wow. And <laughs> I think that's what it is. You want to perseverance. You are going to make mistakes. You guys are going to fail. You, you, you're going to get frustrated. The things you want to do aren't going to pan out the same way. People are going to tell you you're crazy. Don't do <laughs> it. Don't do that. Uh, but there's always going to be that one person that's going to tell you, it's okay, nobody cares, do it. Yeah. But if you fail, so what? Big deal. You tried. You're doing more than somebody else does. I had some advice from an old uh, good friend of mine, Jamie Nieto, and Felix Sanchez, who's a 400 year old ago, mm -hmm. when I was the Pan Ams. And I told you, all my friends are, you know, they're doing this and they're buying homes and doing all this great stuff. He's like, yeah. But not one person, not one of those guys would be willing to give all that up to trade places with you, which encouraged me. So, you know, if you're frustrated doing what you're doing, trust me, there's someone out there that would give, you know, arm and a leg to be what you, to do what you guys are doing because yeah. you have a huge opportunity right now. And so just persevere, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Uh, if science is anything like track and field, as far as reaching your goal, it's going to take a lot of time and you might fail more than you succeed, you know. Yeah. But all those failures makes that one, that one, you know, win, that one medal, so great. That so great. It just yeah. feels so good. Like God, because I want to say this is the last thing I want to say, and I will leave it at this. <laughs> when I walked the and this happened in London. It happened in Rio because you know it's Rio. When I had, when I went to London, I stood before we walked from the village through this loop of a winding fence road or something. We had to get to get to the Olympic Stadium. Okay. And while you're walking, there's a lot of fans screaming, and you get to shake their hands and stuff. Mm -hmm. When I sat in front of the stadium before we walked in, bam, a whole rush of emotion flew over me and I started crying. Mm. And I'm like, why am I crying? I looked at myself <laughs> because it was like 2010, you made a promise to yourself that you were going to go to Olympics and you started to remember all the sacrifice. Look, I get a little emotional thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, you start to remember everything you did to get to that point. And even if I didn't even get to run that race, they say, oh, the Olympics was canceled after that. I knew that I was Olympian. And as soon as I walked to that door, it, it was like a dream country. Everything was right. So yeah. you're going to have a lot of failures, 
but persevere because once you get to that to, once you reach that goal there's nothing there's no other feeling like it there really isn't <laughs> that's spot on and amazing i think it applies very well to what the students will experience through the challenges. Like there's gonna be so many times where the robot, you're like, I told it to do this and there's a little error and, and it just doesn't work the way you want oh, it to work. I can only imagine. <laughs> and especially now, like you said, I, I'm sorry that I mentioned the COVID thing, but the COVID just makes everything so difficult. As far as, especially for me training, everything closed down. I had to find alternate ways to do things. Mm -hmm. I had to invent home workouts. I had to go on the, 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 the uh, asphalt and the street outside to go run. Uh, so it's, it was more taxing on my body than I wanted to be, but you got to find a way to persevere and get through that. Because if it's your passion, it's what you want to do, then you have to find a way. Yeah. So if that little error comes up, it's not doing what I wanted to do. Just, yeah. hey, persevere, find a way around it. There's, there, there's, there, you're going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> so just and then when it forward. happens, like you mentioned, that moment is going to be the best moment. You throw, you throw your equipment, your tools in the air, like, oh, my God, <laughs> finally. It's like a run of motion. You're like, okay, yeah, right, let's go. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> And one other thing you touched on, and I heard it, is a great piece of advice today. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you're not good at it. Just, you know, it doesn't mean that you're, you're bad or that, or, or that you're not capable, right? If, if anything worth going after, like being an Olympian or trying to be one of the top robotics teams is, is really hard. And you're going to have probably a lot more failure moments than you're going to have those great moments. And, Absolutely. But it doesn't mean that you're bad at it. You know, it doesn't mean that you're not up for it. It's just you got to keep pushing forward. So I appreciate your your real, you know, getting deep with us there and sharing your, your emotional parts <laughs> Thank of you. it. Because um, that, that's Thank not you. always easy. But again, I think so many good uh, tips, both from a motivational side from your experiences. And then also you gave us a lot of really good ideas for technology, some that students can work on long term and some that I think they can even start working on tomorrow. Um, so really appreciate your time, everything for you're doing me. to give back. And, um, you know, I can't wait to see when one of these teams reach out, reaches out to you and tags you and says, hey, we're working on the robot. Remind me of what the, you know, what distances we need to, to separate. Um, I really hope that we can do like a follow up someday with one of the teams. And, and, uh, Absolutely. and the, let's call it the uh, hurdle placing robot <laughs> um, for Eric. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll call it the, you can just call it hurdle crew. All right. The hurdle crew robot. Like it's a that. one man. It's a one man hurdle crew. It does everything a, a crew of hurdlers do. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again. Man. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll connect again soon. Thanks again for, for joining us. Jay, appreciate you. Appreciate the community. You guys have a good night. Keep pushing forward. I know you guys uh, will get there and maybe next year, whenever this is all over, we can all meet up and, and you guys see me in person. Any of these teams see me at one of your events. Go ahead and come up to me, say, hey, I saw you, and uh, I'll give you a nice warm handshake. And we, we can all hug and, you know, we celebrate that this is all over and we, get, we can get back to work. There we go. Well, for sure, once we're back to events, I'll take you to the South Florida one. Um, we'll definitely Appreciate go you. and check it out. But thanks again, and see you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in from all over the world. We love you guys.